What seemed like the beginning of the movie to me is we were out with people from Pulp Fiction one night ten years ago. And I go, Uma, I've got the next movie for us. All right, so I just tell her, and it's called Kill Bill. And he was telling me about genre cinema with all the great power and enthusiasm and detail that this cinephile mind can produce, which is pretty extraordinary. And I started talking about this character I wanted to play and this name I wanted to call the character. And For the next couple of weeks, we just proceeded to keep talking about Kill Bill in between takes and everything, sitting around talking about it and musing about it. We kept going back and forth and spun this idea together of this assassin who tries to leave the business and get married. And One of the things she was like, Quentin, what if the first time we see the bride, okay, she's beaten up, blood all over her face, but when we see her, she's wearing a bridal gown. All right, and that was when the bride was born. Then he went his way and did Jackie Brown and started writing his war epic, and I did all whatever I did for seven years. And uh, about three and a half years ago, I ran into him, and I've been out of touch with him. And It was just so cool to see her. So it made me go into my drawer that I had those handwritten pages of Kill Bill again. So I yanked them out and read them and go, this is some funny shit. All right, this would be really good. So I put uh, the war film aside, and then we would start the process of making the movie, and she got pregnant. I kind of just almost had to just consider recasting her for a week just so everyone else would think I wasn't crazy. I could never make a movie with anybody else. So, here we are. <laughs> Quentin couldn't have written me a more challenging, sort of difficult part, because, I mean, she's very, she's sort of an enigma. Just because I have no wish to murder you before the eyes of your daughter does not mean that parading her around in front of me is going to inspire sympathy. She's hard-bitten. She's heartbroken. She's sort of somewhat lean, mean, killing machine. Uma is superwoman. You know, on top of all the, you know, basic movements. She had to master Japanese swords and, you know, a little bit of wire and Japanese language and she worked night and day. Quentin told me the main reason why he wanted to meet with me was because he was in the video store and he saw Two Can Play That Game sitting on the shelf and he said that it stopped him and he said, wow, I haven't seen Vivica since really Independence Day. And he went, there's my Vernita. Vivica is a spitfire. That girl will give it to you. She is awesome. We loved her. She's just full of personality. And she's like, okay, here I am. I'm ready to go, boys. Let's do it. I wanted something physical, and so the only thing I can say is be careful of what you ask for, because here comes Quentin. The character wasn't going to be an American. She was going to be Japanese, full-on Japanese from Japan. But then a friend of mine named Moonsun was the biggest fan of uh, Shanghai Noon. 
So down the line, because in Moonstun, I watched the movie. And I see Lucy Liu in it, and I think she is absolutely amazing in it. I got a phone call from Quentin um, out of the blue, and he was just talking a mile a minute about everything, and he was really excited, and he was talking about the script that he had written, and he mentioned that there was a role that he was considering me for. And when I did get the script, I read it from beginning to end, and I was just so thrilled about it. I decided Oren's not just going to be Japanese. She's going to be half Japanese, half Chinese, Asian American. And she's still going to rule the, you know, the crime world in Tokyo. She will still be the queen of crime in Tokyo. <laughs> Sunny Chiba was, to me, right up there in the 70s with Charles Bronson and Clint Eastwood as just one of the greatest action stars ever. And I've been wanting to work with Sonny since I was a little kid. And Sonny Chiba, one of his coolest things that he, he did amongst all these great movies is he had a TV show, all right, that I used to watch on the Japanese station in Los Angeles in the 80s. And the English title for the show was Shadow Warriors. All right, the Japanese title of the show was Kage no Gunda. <laughs> And the way they do a uh, series in Japan are very different. They do a series for about like uh, like a year or a year and a half. And then when it's over with, it's over. Right? But if it's a success, it takes a year off and then they do another like bunch of episodes and a year later, you know, a, you know, Kage no Gunda 2 appears, all right? And then they, I think they went all the way up to 4 with Kage no Gunda, you know. And each time they did a new show. He was a different Hattori Hanzo. You know, it would be like, you know, Hattori Hanzo the first, and then he'd be Hattori Hanzo the second. It would always take place, you know, like three decades later. And so I just continued that philosophy when I wrote my Hattori Hanzo. So he's Hattori Hanzo the 100th in Kill Bill. Hattori Hanzo ni ittai nan no yo desu ka? Nihon to ka it's yo de. Ittai nihon to nan ni tsukaun desu ka? You must have big rats. You need a Hattori Hanzo as a steel. Huge. Sunny Chiba is just a radiant star, an incredible person, a lovely man. But I, he was first my teacher. And the look on his face when I would, like, was first given the sword and, you know, trying to hold it, and there I was, you know, in the training center, and he just looked absolutely frightened at my abilities but you know I then practiced and worked with his team and and then we finally got to act together then give me one of these these are not for sale I didn't say sell me I said give me <laughs> why should I help you because my vermin is a former student of yours. Acting in a Quentin Tarantino film was just the bomb. The sweatier, grittier, and bloodier I was, the more he liked me. I've always considered action directors the greatest movie directors in the world. If you can do action well, then you're the greatest. <laughs> So the whole idea on Kill Bill was to test the limits of my talent. Okay, action! <laughs> in a way, I think that for Quentin, the action was very challenging, and I think he would say that he taught himself how to shoot action in this movie. He went step by step by step methodically through the process and shot it Hong Kong style of going in continuity and educated himself, you know, gave birth to himself as an action director. And I love his energy, and he really cares so much about this project. And you have to respect that, you know. And he's also open to hearing what you have to say about it. He will also fight for what he thinks 
it is because he's the creator of it. Quentin loves movies so much and he's just enjoying every second. He brought in all these elements of the samurai and the Hong Kong cinema and all these inspirations that had been such a part of him as a filmmaker. I, I think Kill Bill has the same relationship with 70s grindhouse cinema that Raised the Lost Ark had with uh, 1940s and in the late 30s uh, movie serials. And just the way that um, uh, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas had a love for this cinema growing up and how they took the parts of it that they liked the best, their favorite parts of it, and they kind of reinvented it and, you know, and made it work not only for a new audience, but just for an audience that wasn't as familiar with it as they are and did it the way they've always wanted to do it, but keeping all the aspects they liked. All right, That's what I tried to do with all the grindhouse exploitation cinema that I loved. And so like, just a quick rundown of all the different things involved in this movie is like, one, you know, you've got the Yakuza film and the samurai movie. The spaghetti western. This ain't no squirrely amateur. This is the work of a solid dog. But also thrown in there are, you know, there's my little Italian giallo scene. I have my little Brian De Palma sequence in there to give that some fun. <laughs> Way back when the idea was first created, he screened the, John Woo's The Killer for me. And then later came Coffee. This is the end of your rotten life, you dope pusher! And Sergio Leone, Clint Eastwood films. Bruce Lee, Lady Snowblood, a Japanese samurai female revenge film, which was a big inspiration to him. Cut it! Quit! Yeah! The whole combination of, uh, of the right piece of music, all right, with the right visual image, I really think is one of the most exciting things you can do in movies. There's a reason why people remember it in my movies, because when you do it right, it's really memorable. So I've been a fan of the Wu-Tang Clan for a long time and a huge fan of Chris. I met him when I was doing the promotion for uh, the film uh, Iron Monkey. So we meet each other and boom, right away, and we start clicking, all right? She so starts talking about this kung fu movie, that kung fu movie, this kung fu movie, that kung fu movie. And the thing is, if you are a big fan of this genre, you have an immediate response the minute you meet somebody that can keep up with you, all right? Who's seen the same movies, has the same appreciation, loves it as much as you do, and you can name this title and this actor and this title and this actor, and then they, and they know what you're talking about. So we just really click big time. And it was funny, though, because we like, you know, I, was, I was bragging about certain movies, like, I got the first old video cassette that I had for 20 years that nobody don't got. And Quentin's like, yeah, I got the 35 millimeter master. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm pulling out DVDs, he's pulling out the masters. And that was kind of like funny, like real ego man, man talk, you know what I mean? And then after that, it was like, oh, I was like, well, you know, I'm writing Kill Bill. I'm getting that ready to go. And then it just became, uh, um, there was never, oh, by the way, would you like to do the music? Or, hey, Quentin, you think I should do the music? You know, it was not never even a conversation like that. It just kind of... It grew out of that. When he first asked me about music, he asked me, um, would I like, uh, would I like to produce the soundtrack in the way that I produce Wu Tang albums? Because he's like, I listen to your music, and you always use these things and these stairs and all this. And I'm thinking about maybe having you produce my soundtrack. I said, well, it's, you know, whatever, you know, I do. That's easy. I mean, that's like nothing. If that's what you want, consider it done. And not only did he do a fantastic job with both uh, coming up with some uh, neat or original pieces, it was the very first time in one of my movies. But also just, you know, you know, being able to sample some of the different cool sound effects that, you know, we both grew up listening to in kung fu films. We took a few things from old Shaw Brothers stuff to add flavor to it, you know what I mean? For those kung fu buffs that know everything about kung fu movies, they're gonna appreciate it. They're gonna appreciate that just the, when it first comes on, you see the Shaw Brother logo that Quentin used. You know what I mean? They're gonna appreciate those type of things. There's a piece of uh, beautiful music, uh, Zan Fear, the, the pan flute guy, that's uh, used in the movie in a very crucial scene. It's actually even used in the closing credits, all right? And when it was played for me, it was like, this is amazing. This is Japanese samurai meets Sergio Leone, you know, Marconi. All right. I, oh, my God, the, um, the fusing. It's like what the whole movie's about, this fusion. 
All right. Rizzo was like in a Thai restaurant. And it was playing, you know, on their stereo system, all right? And it's like, what is that? I gotta use that for Kill Bill. I was in a uh, in Tokyo doing pre-production on Kill Bill. And I was like walking down, I was like, I had like an hour and a half before I had to leave for the airport. And I had all my crap done. So I, I'm always like walking around in Japan and walking into the store and that store, buying this, buying that, just chilling out, all right? And so there's this like really cool hip clothing store. You know, so it cool retro clothing, all right? And uh, I walk in the store and I'm looking for like a cool shirt or cool jacket, just, you know, something to jump off the shelf. And then they're playing the five, six, seven, eights in there. And it's like, this is a... Um, Boss band, man. So uh, I go up uh, um, to the counter. You know, in English, they're Japanese. You know. And I ask them, who is this? And they go, oh, that's the five, six, seven, eights. All right, really, can I see the CD? Mm -hmm. Show it to me. Mm -hmm. And I go, um, can I buy this? Go, well, no, that's the store copy. This, we're, you know, we're a clothing store. You know, if you want to buy it, though, you can find it at, at Tower Records. They have it there. Go to Tower. And I'm like, I can't go to Tower. I'm going to be leaving too shortly. I, I, I got to leave right now. All right? How about I buy it from you, and I'll give you the money, and I'll pay you even more, and then you can just go and pick it up again at Tower. How about that? I go, well, we have to call the manager. All right? I go, well, could you call him? <laughs> okay. All right? You know, so, uh, um, uh, you know, in Japanese, that's very rude to be that, imp you know, imposing. All right? But uh, it was worth it. Right. I knew I needed to get this, all right? And so, because I knew I wouldn't follow up on it. <laughs> you know, you know, okay, I'll do that, and then you don't do it. All right. And so they called the, uh, um, they called the manager, and the manager said, yeah, sure, okay, fine, you know, $7, okay, great. You know, I start listening to it, and I thought, okay, this is the song for the long, steady cam shot. This will work great. And then I started thinking about, what if I brought the girls down? These girls are as cool as they are, so I asked to get a videotape of the girls performing, and they gave it to me. All right, and I listened to it, and I watched it, and go, oh, they're gonna be so great. Three cool girls, you know, play all their instruments and do surf music in Japanese. How cool is that? And so I brought them down. Those were their own costumes. That's on the production, you know, dressing them up in any crazy way. You know, they have about like six or seven, you know, like the Ronettes. They have six or seven, you know, syncopated outfits. We picked our favorite one, they came out and they just rocked the house, man. They were just great. But you know, I really have to thank uh, that clothing store, because if they hadn't have sold me the CD right then and there, I know I wouldn't have followed up on it. I would have gotten the airplane, I would have forgot about it, and they never would have been in the movie. Some of the movie takes place in China, some of it takes place in, in Japan. And we went to Japan, we went to Hong Kong, we went to the Shaw Brothers Studios, a back lot there to see if we were going to shoot the back lot. We went to mainland China. And it's, it, what it looked like the best idea was to do was to, to base our main base of operations in Beijing and then shoot a little bit in, in Tokyo. We ended up going to uh, the Beijing uh, uh, Film Studio, which is this fantastic film studio that... Um, Mao built, directed, and make propaganda films. That was like the personal project of Mao's wife. And what's really cool about the studio is it's not just a studio, it's a community. Because the technicians that worked for the Beijing film studios, they signed lifetime contracts. So that was their home. They had a job for life. And so thus they have schools and apartment buildings and stores and all kinds of stuff there. And it was quite an experience. That is a Well, there were multiple translators running around the set at all times. There was the Japanese to English translators, the Chinese to English translators, the Japanese to Chinese translators were equally as essential. All right, now we're ready to get one for Canada. This is going to be a smile. And you've seen how difficult it is, but we're going to get it. And, you know, it was sort of like that. You know, it was kind of madhouse. Unconsciously, I think what happens with Quentin, he just soaks that stuff up like a sponge. Just living, sitting, breathing that culture. Little things seep in, you know, and they just end up in the movie. So just being there in China was an amazing thing. And uh, he didn't want an all-American crew to go over to China and say, this is how we're going to do it, and they're going to go to Japan. He, he really wanted the input of 
nationals from those countries and to see what they brought. It was sad to leave. It was very sad to leave. So much so that to me, pretty much for the rest of the movie, when we went back to America to shoot, I felt like we were on location because it felt like when we were shooting in the Beijing film studios, we were home. Action! Very good. There's something about Quentin's sensibility that he creates his own world, he creates his own style. It's going to be non-stop, kick you in the ass, filming. You never know what you're going to expect. Ah! It's vintage Tarantino.